so next video will be the next instalment of certain features of the historical development of Marxism and they, that is the introduction part of the historical destiny of the doctrine of Karl Marx. The chief thing in the doctrine of Marx is that it brings out the historic role of the proletariat as a builder of socialist society. Has the course of events all over the world confirmed this doctrine since it was expanded by Marx? Marx first advanced it in 1844. The Communist Manifesto of Marx and Engels, published in 1848, gave an integral and systematic exposition of this doctrine. an exposition which has remained the best to this day. Since then, world history has clearly been divided into three main periods. One, from the Revolution of 1848 to the Paris Commune 1871. Two, from the Paris Commune to the Russian Revolution 1905. And three, since the Russian Revolution. Let us see what, the, what has been the destiny of Marx's doctrine in each of these periods. One, at the beginning of the first period of Marx's doctrine, by no means dominated, it was only one of the very numerous groups or trends of socialism. The forms of socialism did not dominate, were in the main akin to an narrativism, incomprehension of the materialist basis of historical movement, inability to single out the role and significance of each class, in capitalist society, concealment of the Burgoyne's nature of democratic reforms under diverse quasi-socialist phrases about the people, justice, right, and so on. The revolution of 1848 struck a deadly blow at all these voices for a smotly and ostentatious forms of pre-Marxism, socialism. In all countries, the revolution revealed the various classes of society in action. The shooting of the workers by the Republican Bergois in Paris in the June days of 1848 finally revealed that the proletariat alone was socialist by nature. The liberal, liberal Bergois dreaded the independence of this class a hundred times more than it did any kind of reaction. The craven liberals groveled before reaction. The peasantry were content with the ab abolition of the survivals of feudalism and joined the supporters of order, wavering but occasionally between workers, democracy and Bergoglio's liberalism. All doctrines of non-class socialism and non-class politi politics proved to be sheer nonsense. The Paris Commune 1871 completed this de development of Bergoglio's changes. The Republic, i.e. the form of politi political organisation in which class relations appear in their most unconcealed form owed its consolidation solely to the hero heroism of Polaritat. In all the other European countries, a more tangled and less complete development led to the same result, a Bergoglio society that had taken definitive shape. Towards the end of the first period, 1848 to 71, of first storms and revolutions, pre-Marxism, socialism was dead. Independent proletariat parties came into being. The first in international 1864-72 in the German Social Democratic Party. 2. The second period 1872-1904 was distinguished from the first by its peaceful character, by the absence of revolutions. The East had not yet risen to them. The West entered a phase of peaceful preparations for the changes to come. Socialist parties, basically proletarian, were formed everywhere and learned to use Bergoglio's proletarianisms and to fan their own daily press. Their educational institutions, their trade unions and their cooperative societies, Marx's doctrine gained a complete victory and began to spread. The selection and mustering of the forces of the, of the proletariat and its preparation for the coming battles made slow but steady progress. The dialectics of history were such that the theoretical victory of Marxism compelled its enemies to disguise themselves as Marxists. Liberalism, rotten within, tried to, it, to revive itself in the form of socialist opportunism. They inter interpreted the period of preparing the forces of 
for great battles as renunciation of these battles, improvement of the conditions of the slaves to fight against wage slavery. They took to mean the sale of slaves or their right to liberty for a few pence. They cravenly preached social peace, i.e. peace with the slave owners, renunciation of the class struggle, etc. They had very many adherents among social members of parliament, various officials of the working class movement and the sympathising intelligentsia. 3. However, the opportunists had scarcely congratulated themselves on social peace and on the non-necessity of storms under democracy when a new source of great world storms opened up in Asia. The Russian Revolution was followed by revolutions in Turkey, Persia and China. It is in this era of storms and their repercussions in Europe that we are now living, no matter what the fate of the great Chinese Republic against which various civilized hyenas are now wetting their teeth, no power on earth can restore the old serfdom in Asia or wipe out the heroic democracy of the masses in the Asiatic and semi-Asiatic countries. Certain people who were inattentive to the conditions for preparing and developing the mass struggle were driven to despair and to anarchism by the lengthy delays in the decisive struggle against capitalism in Europe. We can now see how short-sighted and faint-hearted this anarchist despair is. The fact that Asia, with its population of 800 million, has been drawn into the struggle for these same European ideals should inspire us with optimism and not despair. The Asiatic revolutions have again shown us the spinelessness and baseness of liberalism, the exceptional importance of the independence of the democratic masses and the pronounced demarc demarcation between the Polaritat and the Bagoys of all kinds. After the experience both of Europe and Asia, anyone who speaks of non-class politics and non-class socialism ought simply to be put in a cage and exi exhibited alongside the Australian kangaroo or something like that. After Asia, Europe has also begun to stir, although not in the Asiatic way. The peaceful period of 1872 to 1904 has passed, never to return. The high cost of living and the tyranny of the trusts are leading to an unprecedented sharpening of the economic struggle which has sent into movement even the British workers who have been corrupted by liberalism. We see a political crisis brewing even in the most die-hard Bagoys, Junker country, Germany. The frenzied army and the poli policy of imperialism are turning modern Europe into a social peace which is more like gunpowder barrel. Meanwhile, the decay of all the Bagoys parties and the maturing of the Polaritat are making steady progress. Since the appearance of Marxism, each of the three great periods of world history has brought Marxism new confirmation and new triumphs, but a still greater triumph awaits Marxism as a doctrine of the Polaritat in the coming period of history. So, that is the next part.